The South African Broadcasting Corporation is the public broadcaster in South Africa and provides 19 radio stations, AM and FM, as well as six television broadcasts to the general public. And it is one of the largest of South Africa's state-owned enterprises. But where did it all start? I must confess that as a person who was not over-enthusiastic about the introduction of television, I'm pleasantly surprised with what I've seen so far. Radio broadcasting in South Africa began in 1923 under the all species of South African railways. Transnet Freight Rail is a South African rail transport company formerly known as Spornet. It was part of the South African Railways and Harbors Administration, a state-controlled organization that employed hundreds of thousands of people for decades from the first half of the 20th century and was widely referred to by the initial SAR and H or SAS and H in Afrikaans. Customer complaints about serious problems with Transnet Freight Rail Service were reported in 2010. Its head office is in Inyanda House in Parktown, Johannesburg. So three radio services were licensed, the Association of Scientific and Technical Societies in Johannesburg, the Cape Peninsula Publicity Association in Cape Town, and the Durban Corporation, which began broadcasting in 1924. These merged into the African Broadcasting Company in 1927, which was owned by a wealthy businessman, Isidore Willem, that's her name. And on the 1st of August, 1936, they were sold to the SABC through an act of parliament. The SABC took over the African Broadcasting Company staff and assets. That uh, there had been some 10 years of discussion in Parliament about the advisability or not of, int of introducing a television service. South Africa was the last uh, fairly industrialised country ever to get television. There was a very good reason for that, because there's great fear of television that it would introduce liberal ideas, introduce communism, would introduce ideas of racial equality, whatever you wanted to call that, into South Africa. Following its establishment in 1936, the SABC established services in what were then the country's official languages, English and Afrikaans, with the Afrikaans service being established in 1937. Broadcasts in languages such as Isizulu, Isikosa, Sesotho and Setswana followed in 1940. I'm going to give you the very last time check on Springbok Radio and um, that was Tuesday night, the 31st of December 1985 at exactly 6.30. It was Colin Flux who said, I'm going to give you a time check, my very first time check I gave on Springbok Radio with apologies to the sponsors concerned, 1970. Tick, tick time it, tick, tick time it, guaranteed, inexpensive quality watches. Now the time on Springbok at the next stroke of the gong will be exactly 28 minutes past six. Springbok Radio, the SABC's first commercial radio service, started broadcasting on the 1st of May 1950, bilingual in English and Afrikaans, and it broadcasted from the Johannesburg Center. The service proved to be so popular with advertisers that at the time of its launch, commercial time had been booked well in advance. The station featured a wide variety of programming such as a morning talk and news, game shows, soap operas like Basis Bravo, children's programming, music request programs, top 10 music, talent shows and other musical entertainment. One popular Saturday noontime comedy show was Telephone Time. Fantastic. Now Telephone Time was a show which the host would like call various people and conjure up a comedic scenario which was actually similar to the brand of humor to the films of Leon Schuster. And to welcome you to the show. Here's the new service was established in June 1950, replacing the programs of the BBC, although this was because the BBC broadcasts were seen as giving British viewpoints of current affairs. There were also concerns that the SABC service would become overly pro-government or our master's voice, basically. By 1968, it had over a hundred full-time reporters in the main cities and local correspondents all over the country. It was as simple as that. Rolling. Pocket. 18, one. Action. And I think that that's what got television off the ground. Youthful enthusiasm, youthful passion for film and television. The SABC was able to form an orchestra of 80 musicians in 1954. The SABC Symphony Orchestra has its origins in three studio ensembles in Johannesburg, Durban and Cape Town and the Municipal Orchestra of the Johannesburg City Council. When the SABC centralized its broadcasting in Johannesburg, the future of the three ensembles were in doubt. But at the same time, the Municipal Orchestra of the Johannesburg City Council had been disbanded.
And while its main base was at the Johannesburg City Hall, it would tour the country and the orchestra would be led for many years by SABC's head of music, Anton Hartman, but had other conductors as well, such as Francesco Manda and Edgar Cree. There were also international composers such as Ego Stravinsky and the SABC Junior Orchestra was also created and began in February 1966 under Walter Moni. Then you've got to make sure that all your young people can enter the countries. They must have all their visas. I'm not even talking about uh, hotel accommodation, which you've got to find for a large group like this, where you have 85 people and you've got to try and group them where they are friends together. And you know what young people are like. They start as friends at the beginning. But through the tour, they don't look nice to one another anymore. So you've got to attend to that as well. And then after the first night of concert, once the presentations take place, I can say that the contacts we build up between the countries is well worth it. By 1985, Springbok Radio was operating at a heavy loss after losing many listeners with the handing over of its shortwave frequencies to Radio 5 and facing competition from television, it ceased broadcasting on the 31st of December, 1985. Now, it's not a new thing with the SAPC is struggling. It's always actually been the case. But anyway, regional commercial FM music stations were started in the 1960s. Radio Highfalt in 1964, Radio Good Hope in 1965, Radio Port Natal in 1967 and Radio Jacaranda, Radio Orania, or Radio Orange, Radio Algoa were all created in 1986. So following the establishment of a republic and withdrawal from the Commonwealth in 1961, the Afrikaners' goal was to promote their culture. And so at first, the SABC's choice of popular music reflected the National Party government's initial conservatism especially on the Afrikaans channel with musicians such as Nico Carstens. However, Carstens was also um, ostracized by the SABC as his music was influenced by the colored and Malay communities of Cape Town. Eventually, musicians broke through the barrier when the young English-speaking Jewish musician and composer Charles Siegel collaborated with the older Afrikaans lyric writer Anton Deval. So they wrote songs together and Seagull's songs like the O Galahari became highly popular in the Afrikaans speaking uh, public. However, there was tight censorship over all broadcasts, particularly of pop music. For example, the music of the Beatles being banned by the SABC between 1966 and March 1971. We were working under extremely difficult conditions because remember it was apartheid government Nationalist Party was in power. SABC was actually administered by Brudewon thinking. In 1966, the SABC established an external service known as Radio RSA, which broadcast in English, Swahili, French, Portuguese, Dutch, and German. So we had Swahili before we had Isizu or Situan. Crazy. In 1969, the SABC held a national contest to find theme music for the service. This contest was won by the popular South African pianist and composer Charles Siegel and co-writer Dorothy Aronson. The composition Carousel remained the theme song for the Radio RSA until 1992, until it was replaced by Channel Africa. Because this is a this is a channel that covers the whole of Africa yeah. and internationally as well. I mean, besides on the continent, it goes off 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 our seas as well, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Talk to us about the idea behind the formation of the station. Yeah, all those years back. Yeah, um, look, the, the session was formed by the then government uh, in 1966, and uh, by that time it resided in the uh, Minister of Information. So the station has moved from the Minister of Information then uh, to the Department of Foreign Affairs or Minister of Foreign Affairs, and after the 1994, in the new disp dispensation, then it was moved to the Department of Communication. In 1986, the SABC ran a competition to promote South African music, and each of the 15 radio stations represented by an artist entered a song to compete for the song for South Africa in the National Song Festival. The finals were broadcast live on television and the Radio Port Natal submission won the competition with the Don Clark song, San Bonani, performed by PJ Powers and Hotline. 
1975, after years of controversy over the introduction of television, the SABC was finally allowed to introduce a color TV service, which began experimental broadcast in the main cities on the 5th of May 1975 before the service went nationwide on the 6th of January 1976. Initially, the TV service was funded entirely through a license fee, just like the UK, but began advertising in 1978. The SABC, both television and radio, is still partly funded by the license fee, I think, which is currently 250 rand a year. And the service at the time initially broadcasted only in English and Afrikaans, which they also had an emphasis on religious programming on Sundays. And a local soap opera, The Villages, set on a gold mine was well received, while other local productions like The Dingleys were panned as amateurish. The majority of acquired programming on South African television came from the United States, and some production companies stopped selling programs to the country, and the British Actors Union Equity had already started to boycott um, program sales to South Africa, which was not lifted until 1993. However, the Thames television police drama series, The Sweeney and the Fond of Valk, were briefly shown on SABC TV, as was the original version of Thunderbirds. Yeah, we, 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 we had to make it happen. We had to get pictures on the air come the 5th of January 1976. And we were given certain briefs in terms of what have to, had to happen. But the people above us knew nothing of the technicalities. They didn't know what was required to make it happen. People at my level and below knew and were learning what in fact was required to get these pictures on the air. So yeah, we, 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 we worked and we just made it happen. It was as simple as that. Many imported programs were dubbed into Afrikaans and other indigenous languages, but in 1985, in order to accommodate English speakers, the SABC began to simulcast the original language audio of series on an FM radio service called Radio 2000, allowing viewers to watch them in the original language. And the first English language series to be simulcasted was Miami Vice. Black hell. SABC TV also produced lavish music shows featuring the most popular South African composers, solo musicians, bands, and orchestras. For example, the pianist and composer that I keep mentioning, Charles Siegel, was given half an hour of a special show, the music of Charles Siegel. That's crazy. Where a selection of his music was performed by various local artists such as Zane Adams, SABC Orchestra, and others. However, it also broadcast pop music series like Pop Shop, which consisted of overseas and local music, and Double Track, which consisted of um, only local artists. With a limited budget, early programming aimed at children tended to be quite innovative, and programs such as Afrikaans language puppet shows Haas, Das, Nias Gas, and Oscar in Os Blickfontein are still fondly remembered by many. On the 1st of January 1981, two services were introduced, Television 2 broadcasting in Isizulu and Isikosa, and Television 3 broadcasting in Sesotho and Setswana, both targeted at a black urban audience. The main channel, which was called Television 1 at the time, was divided evenly between English and Afrikaans as before. In 1986, a new service called Television 4 was introduced carrying sports and entertainment programming taking over the frequencies used by Television 2 and Television 3, which then had to end broadcasting at 2100 hours. In 1991, Television 2, Television 3 and Television 4 were combined into a new service called CCV, Contemporary Community Values. A third channel was introduced known as TSS or Top Sport Surplus Sport. Top Sport being the brand name for the SABC sport coverage. But this was replaced by NNTV, National Network TV, an educational non-commercial channel in 1993. And let me say without hesitation, we are determined in this country to uphold those high standards of Christian civilization. And we are. We expect of the SABC and the SATV to assist in doing precisely that. And one of the chief reasons why we are indeed so proud of our SABC, our SATV, and may I say and may I give you a very great man, Dr. P.J. Mayer, the chairman of the SABC, the SA guy. Until 1979, the SABC operated broadcasting services in Namibia, which was then under South African rule, but in that year, these were transferred to the Southwest African Broadcasting Corporation. However, the SWABC retained technical personnel from the SABC 
and a number of its programs were prepared at the SABC studios in Johannesburg before being dispatched to Windhoek for transmission. The SABC also helped the SWABC to establish a television service in 1981. This comprised a mix of programming in English, Afrikaans and German, 90% of which came from the SABC. Programs were shown locally a week after South Africa and the SWABC received SABC TV programming, which they helped with recording, editing and rebroadcasting, first by using a microwave link and later via an Intelsat satellite link. And so the SWAPC became the Namibian Broadcasting Corporation after the country's independence in 1990. However, Walvis Bay and Enclave of South Africa in Namibia until 1994 received the SABC's Television One on a low power repeater, which was broadcast live via Intelsat from 1986. Good evening. The United States says it considers the African National Congress to be an African nationalist organization which is seeking to replace the present government of South Africa through violence as well as other means. The conventional response that SATV learned very quickly was that any momentous event or any movement was always shown to be simply some or other sort of inchoate violent happening. So the SABC maintained a state monopoly on radio until the launch in December 1979 of Capital Radio 604, then Radio 702 in 1980. Although the subscription-funded television service Mnet launched in 1986, the SABC had a monopoly on free-to-air television until the launch of ETV in 1998. During National Party rule from 1948, it came under increasing accusations of being biased towards the ruling party at one time, most of the senior management were members of an Africana secret society and later from institutions like Stellenbosch University. From a political point of view, from a control point of view, we were what the SABC was all about. SABC was the, it wasn't black, it wasn't English, it was Afrikaans. And if you think of the line of control that goes up, first to the Bruderbond and then to the government. When Pitt Mayer, the final report on the viability of television in South Africa came out, it was first given to the Bruderbond before it was presented to the government. The SABC was a radio service until the introduction of television in 1976. There were three main SABC radio stations, the English service, later known as Radio South Africa, the African service, later known as Radio St. Africa and African Stereo, and then the commercial station Springbok Radio. I think to be in television in the 1970s, that was the time to be in television. In 1986, the SABC's monopoly on the television industry was challenged by the launch of a subscription-based service known as Mnet which was backed by a lot of newspaper publishers. This service was, however, prohibited from broadcasting its own news programs, which was still the preserve of the SABC. Areas and pamphlets yes, we had contact with the security forces. We had, we had, we had people that we, that we spoke to quite regularly in the security forces. Number one, to get news. Some of our best news we got from the security forces, bona fide news. Number two, we built up uh, relationships with some of these people because we were, the, we were the, uh, the visual medium. I mean, we knew. We knew we, what we could do and what we could not do. And this does not mean that we were ideologically programmed to sort of be a, a, an extension of, of, of the government in power. That's not what we're saying. We had to manage the situation as best as we could. And for what it's worth to you, under those very difficult circumstances, we were in a catch-22 situation. We applied, as far as we could, journalistic ethics and principles. Direct-to-home satellite television in South Africa began when Mnet's parent company, MultiChoice, launched its first in-the-world digital satellite TV service. We all know it, EDS-TV, in 1995. 